We really had three major goals in pursuing a feasibility study for the Elk Creek project. The first was to de-risk the project. And you de-risk the project by uh, getting all of the detailed information that you get during the FS process. You advance the permitting. You, you get a, a lot of confidence around your ability to execute on the project. The second thing is uh, you want to declare a reserve. And, and a reserve is a mining term. And it really uh, says that you can go to this place at this time and, and you can get this amount of uh, metal out of the ground and you can sell it. And then the final thing that we really wanted to do was really set up uh, ourselves for financing. So we now have the feasibility study. We will soon have the feasibility study report. And this is what the financing institutions are going to look to us for as a way to deliver uh, on the project and execute it. Well, a lot of people are asking us what the goal of the feasibility study is. And, and, you know, that's an interesting question to me. And what I'd like to do is to actually take us back a little bit to a higher level. Because our, our goal with this project is to finance it, construct it, and ultimately to operate it. Because that's how we generate revenues. That's how we get a return to the shareholder on a consistent basis. So the feasibility study is one step along the way. And the feasibility study is meant to de-risk a project. And, and we have clearly de-risked the project as a result of finishing this feasibility study. The details that Scott and his team have gotten into with this particular feasibility study are some of the, the deepest details I have seen in my 35 years. They have virtually an operating plan uh, for, for our business, and, and we're calling it a feasibility study. So the, the depth that this feasibility study has gotten into is, is actually tremendous. And it will be viewed as a huge de-risking tool by anybody, uh, body institutional or otherwise, that, that wants to invest in this project. So the real goal behind a feasibility study is, first of all, you know, is the project positive? Absolutely, it's positive. We're thrilled with that NPV. You know, is it, is it a doable project? Is it constructible? Absolutely, it's constructible. And Scott and his team have worked out all those details. This is an outstanding tool that we will now use to take us to the next step, which is financing. Well, the concept of de-risking all goes to financing, right? I mean, financing is, is the next step. And what we needed to do was to put a feasibility study together that the banks, the institutional investors on the equity side, will all use to make their decision as to whether or not they want to come into this project. The feasibility study is particularly important when you have a greenfield project like we do. There is nothing out there on the ground right now. And somebody that's going to put multiple hundreds of millions of dollars into a project wants to make sure that their investment is sound and their risk is low, particularly on the debt side. So this feasibility study clearly accomplishes that and will give a whole different level of comfort to both the debt and the equity investors. As, as just about all of our shareholders know, we have received in principle eligibility status under the German Loan Guarantee Program. And that's a result of our 50% our offtake agreement with Thyssen Krupp out of Germany. So the next step now that we have the feasibility study uh, done and, and once it's published, we'll be able to take that study hand it to the German government loan guarantee program, and they will now do the next level of approval on this project. We're very anxious for that to happen because we think that could be a very good initial indicator to our shareholders and other interested parties that financing is actually very real for this project.
Uh, feasibility studies of this size and, and complexity uh, need to be conservative. Uh, they need to be conservative to be credible, and they need to be conservative to uh, stand up to outside scrutiny. <clears throat> when we do a feasibility study, uh, again, for a project like this, uh, we really have to go out and we have to get uh, costs and bids uh, from, from vendors. Uh, we can't make assumptions about that. We have to use real numbers. Uh, similarly, on pricing, uh, we have to go out and we, we have to understand what the market is, but we, we can't be uh, too promotional in, in what we say about pricing. It has to be something that, that will stand up to scrutiny. And I think finally, when we put together a project of this magnitude, uh, we have to be very realistic about the sequence of events, how the project is built, uh, and, and ensure that what we are saying is reasonable. Uh, at, at, a, at a lower level of study, you might be able to say, well, we could build this project in maybe two years, and that would be okay. Uh, but at a feasibility study level, you have a very detailed schedule. Uh, one event has to follow the other, uh, and it has to be something that you can realistically accomplish. A lot of people are going to be comparing our PEA versus our feasibility study, and, and we invite that. I mean, we do it internally as well. But the, the interesting thing is that they're very two, they're, they're two very different studies, bottom line. The, the assumptions that you're allowed to make in a PEA study are a whole different level and way less conservative, way less detailed than what we have to get into in the feasibility study. So, you know, go ahead and compare them because that's a natural thing to do. But bottom line is, these are two very different studies, and, and it's really the feasibility study that the institutional you know, debt and equity holders will be looking at. They don't even look at a PEA. You know, the, the feasibility study for the Elk Creek Project has really evolved over the last few years. We've done a lot of studies in the lab to understand how we're going to recover these different uh, metals from the rock. Uh, we've done a lot of work understanding the hydrogeologic regime and what we have to do, the, the very specific sequence of steps that we have to take to dewater the underground resource so that we can access it for mining. Uh, we've, we've done a great deal of work to understand um, how we're going to bring in utilities to the site. The site's not going to run without electricity and natural gas. Uh, you have to understand what it costs to bring those things in, how they're going to tie in, and when they're going to tie in. So there's a, there's a lot of detail that goes into a feasibility study. And at, at earlier stages of, of study on a project like this, you can make some, some assumptions about those things. But really, when you get to feasibility level, it has to be very hard and fast. As we developed the process to recover metals from the Elk Creek ore, we had to make some decisions and trade-offs. Uh, that's, a, that's a characteristic of any project of this size and complexity. <clears throat> so what you see reflected in our feasibility study results is that uh, we focused on uh, recovering scandium. In fact, we've actually increased the recovery of scandium compared to earlier studies on the project. And that's a good thing for the project's economics. We've also uh, worked to balance uh, a high recovery of niobium uh, with the need to minimize capital costs in the plant. So uh, as we look at how we recover niobium, uh, we kind of reached an equilibrium point where we have a, a decent recovery, uh, but we've minimized the size of the equipment and thus the capital cost of those units that are involved in niobium recovery. <clears throat> I think the one thing that, that has come out of that analysis that ends up being a trade-off is that we had to sacrifice some titanium recovery to maintain the recovery of the other two products. But that makes a lot of sense because the titanium is the lowest value of the three products that we're going to produce. You know, I'm very proud of the team that we put together to execute the Elk Creek project. And, and we have some great folks here uh, within the company that have come up with some, some innovative ideas uh, to try and make this project just, just better and better. And I want to highlight two areas there. I think uh, on the environmental side, uh, we've done a, a really good job at, at working with the regulators, understanding what their concerns are, and, and being responsive to those concerns, and, and developing a project that really has a minimal environmental footprint. 
Uh, that's good for the environment. It also gives uh, some comfort uh, on the regulatory side that uh, this is a company that's going to come in and do the right thing, and, and it really helps us in that arena. I think the other place that, that we've had a lot of innovation is on the process side of the project. So what we have done, and we've done this very intentionally, is that we have developed a process using existing technologies, but we've put those technologies together in an innovative way. It's taken a considerable amount of time in the lab to establish how all that's going to work, uh, but we're very confident at this point that we've got something uh, that's, that's going to be cost effective, that's going to work, and that's going to deliver good value for our shareholders. I think what we have done, uh, particularly in the process development, has been a win-win both on the environmental side and, and, and on the process side. <clears throat> so we've made decisions uh, as we've gone through uh, the process of, of developing how, how the plant's going to work, where we have, for instance, uh, minimized the amount of, of water that we need to use and, and thus treat in the plant. Uh, by minimizing the amount of water that we use, uh, we are minimizing our environmental footprint. The other thing that we've done is we've done very extensive environmental studies of the plant area and, and, and some off-site areas. And by doing those studies and doing them up front, uh, we can avoid impacting sensitive areas of the environment. Uh, that helps us on the regulatory side. Uh, it minimizes our environmental footprint. And, and as we've gone through and we've made uh, process innovations, we've been able to uh, really drive some cost reductions in the project as well. So for instance, we've made innovations in the plant that have reduced our reliance on outside materials to run the plant with. That reduces the amount of traffic coming into the plant. It eliminates things like the need for a rail spur. It minimizes traffic in the local area, which I'm sure the local folks in Elk Creek will appreciate. And it gives us a better project at the end of the day. Permitting has been a focus of the Elk Creek project right from the get-go. We recognized uh, right from the start of the feasibility study process in 2014 that uh, we needed to expend some effort on the permitting side. We needed to, to get in front of the regulators and get those processes started so that we could execute on the project when it came time to build it. And that has really paid dividends. We started our engagement with the Army Corps of Engineers in 2014. And that led us down a path where we've done a lot of good work and we're now able to say we can build uh, the plant, we can build most of the offsite infrastructure, and we have those permits in hand right now. We could start that tomorrow. And, and that's a great place to be uh, when you reach the point where you've just issued your feasibility study. Going forward from this point, uh, we retain a focus on, on the environmental permitting because you need to have those permits in hand to build the project. So we've prioritized the permitting regime to focus on the ones that we need uh, right now. And all of that work is underway with, with the state and the federal regula regulators in Nebraska. Uh, we have other uh, permitting needs that we will need to complete the project. And we're in the process of getting all that work started soon. We built a very comprehensive schedule based on our understanding of all of the permitting requirements here so that we've, we've got a link between the permitting needs and, and the needs on the construction side of the project so that we'll have a very smooth transition uh, through that process and we don't expect to have any holdups. You know, it's very clear to me that to undertake a project like the Elk Creek Project, you're going to need the support of the local folks. And uh, myself and other members of the team have spent a lot of time just one-on-one -on -one at people's kitchen tables talking about the project, explaining what we're doing, uh, talking about the next steps, and, and what they can expect to see when this project becomes a reality. And, and that, that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort, but it pays a lot of dividends. And, you know, I will say without, without question, the people in southeast Nebraska are, are just fantastic to work with. Uh, they're very responsive, they're very supportive, and they're anxious to see this project go to the next stage.
at the state level, we've been engaging with the state regulators for uh, quite a long time. We really started that in 2014. And, and we really have found that the state level regulators in Nebraska have been very good to work with. Uh, they're very professional, uh, they're very knowledgeable, uh, but at the same time, they recognize that a project like Elk Creek is a new thing for Nebraska. So they've been very anxious to learn about what it is that the project is gonna do and how it's gonna work. And they've been very responsive uh, to us uh, as we've come in uh, to talk about permits, to talk about permitting needs, what information they need to, to process our applications. And, and it's really been a very rewarding experience to work with these folks because they wanna see the project done, but they wanna see the project done right. You know, water is a very critical issue on the Elk Creek project. We understood very early on that this deep subsurface, very isolated thing that we're going to be mining has a considerable amount of water in it. Now, it's not connected to any surface water source. It's not something that will affect uh, irrigation or potable water use in the area. But we recognized that we had, to, we had to pump that water out to enable the mining process to move forward. And we also recognized that uh, we needed to manage the water once we got it to the surface. <clears throat> Having that water is, is actually a bit of a blessing for the project because we can use that water in our process. We can also use the water to make uh, drinking water for our folks so that we don't have to draw on local water supplies that supply, for instance, Johnson and Pawnee County. However, uh, that blessing is, is a little bit of a blessing in disguise because we have a bit more water than we can, than we can use in the operation. So what that, that drives is a need to, to manage the water and, and we've done a very exhaustive analysis on, on how we're going to do that. And, and the option that came to the top of that analysis is installing a water line from our project site to the Missouri River. Now this water does have a, a brackish characteristic to it. It is slightly salty. Uh, no real metals to speak of, no other constituents of concern. But we do want to take that water to the Missouri River and, and it was very important to us that in doing so, we met all of the state's water quality standards. So we've engineered a system such that uh, as the water gets into the Missouri River, it mixes very quickly and with a very short distance, we meet all of the state's water quality standards uh, for the Missouri River. Yeah, one, of, one of the areas that we're pretty excited about is the level of discussion in the various governments around the world about massive infrastructure projects. This is nothing but good news to the NIOCORP project. Uh, niobium, as everyone knows, uh, has various uh, uses and applications. The number one use of niobium is in, is in infrastructure and architectural purposes. So any of these discussions about massive re rebuilding and, and, and re you know, reconstituting our infrastructure, that's nothing but positive for NIOCORP. Thank you.